Hello everybody, I'm Tim, and I'm so honoured to be here, I'm so very touched that you guys invited me to, to, to be here, it's such an important week, week to, be, to be doing this as well, um, and um, for some reason this, this talk is called You're Not Guilty. Um, people like me suck. We suck, we totally and utterly suck. People like me, meaning thinkers who talk about the environment and, and global warming and stuff. I, I call it global warming because it's what is specifically happening. Sure, you can call it climate change, like that Reagan operative bullied everyone to do. Then they can say correctly, what, what's the big deal? The climate's always been changing. No, this time the globe, this specific actual globe, is warming, specifically actually warming. And what does that mean, by the way? Global warming means mass extinction. That's such a terrifying phrase, I, I don't like to use it much. I like to use global warming because it's, it's realistic and intense. I don't like to say mass extinction because I'm absolutely scared out of my mind and really, really sad about it. Because if there were no life forms like on Venus, then global warming or whatever you want to call it doesn't mean a thing. No worries, mass extinction. There have already been five on this planet. The last one was the asteroid that, that, that wiped out the dinosaurs. Now we are the asteroid. We are the asteroid. Here we are sitting here in our seats and yet and at the same time we're hurtling towards Earth at 50,000 miles an hour. That's the kind of multi-scale perception you start to have with ecological awareness, whether you like it or whether you don't. The previous one, the, the one before the asteroid that wiped the dinosaurs, was called the End Permian Extinction. Actually, that was global warming event. It was mostly caused by, by a massive undersea explosion of methane. All but 4% of life forms were wiped. I'm going to say that again. Every single life form on this planet went extinct. Bacteria, fish, reptiles, all but 4%. 96% of life was wiped. That's much, much, much worse than the asteroid, in fact. The end Permian extinction happened over the course of 40,000 years. This one will take about 100. What happens when it takes a few hundred years? What's that like, 40,000 years of extinction compressed into a couple of hundred? Hey, let's not talk about it anymore. Let's go back to good old global warming. I can, I can sort of handle it. I can only think about mass extinction for one second a day without wanting to collapse into the fetal position, which is no place from which to help the polar bears and the coral. Thank you for slightly laughing. And, and thank you for laughing a little bit more. And us, if, 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 if we go, they go, because dolphins can't turn off the oil pipes with their flippers. This is on us, mass extinction. I heard this really sad piece on my favorite radio station, BBC Radio 4, two days ago, which is that 60% of land animals have gone extinct in the last 40 years. That's up from the 50% they announced about four years ago. So why do people like me suck? Well, you know, white guys and white boy philosophers, you know, AKA mansplainers and all that. Well, we go around telling you that your world doesn't matter compared to this stuff. And we tell you to respect that fact. And we tell you to like the efficient future where you won't even have the little amounts of enjoyment you have now, like pushing the gas pedal of your car. Someone like me has to say it, so I'm gonna say it right here. I'm really, really gonna miss pressing the gas pedal, the engine hum under me, the feeling of driving like that. And especially because I drive when I feel depressed or upset, it helps. But people like me go, and you're going to like it too. Your world means nothing, and you won't be able to protect yourself from what I'm about to say, and you won't be able to do any of the fun things you do now, and you're going to like that. And we say you should feel guilty, really, really guilty, that you put so much into your world and ignored this. Say you're pitching an art project, a public art project somewhere, say it's in Brooklyn. Well, the community is gonna choose something that reflects the community, and they're gonna turn down the ecological art. I know because I've been part of a team that tried, but because I wasn't in charge of the pitch, I'm pretty sure I know how it went down. The general vibe of ecological stuff is your world is meaningless. Your world doesn't matter. It matters so much less than the one the eco person is talking about because they're talking about the big picture, the biggest picture, the top level. Lots of people like me are pointing furiously at penguins or whatever, which is a way of pointing but our ego. It's funny how people often are the inverse of the thing they're talking about the most. 
And this combines with something that is, as we say, empirically true. It's true that the whole biosphere is a lot bigger than Brooklyn, but if you didn't accept things just because they were physically bigger, you may never have left your house because the outside tends, in my experience anyway, to be bigger than the inside, which is the real reason why it's polite to let people out of elevators and trains and corner stores first before you get in. The your world is meaningless thing is so pervasive that you really have to fight against it if you want your art project to be installed in public space in, in Brooklyn. So, Houston, I'm from Houston, can you, can you tell? Thanks for laughing a slightly more. Um, please keep going, it's very good for my ego. So I can say it this way, Houston, we have a problem. We do have this huge global intense thing to sort out, it's terrifying. But the way we talk about it is also terrifying, and it erases the worlds of the people we're talking to. You know, you can inhabit lots of worlds at once. You can be a member of your local library, you can visit your local women's group, you can participate in general elections, hint, hint, and you can be American and British at the same time like me, like I've got the two most embarrassing passports on the planet right now. Hooray. Um, worlds don't necessarily cancel each other out, they intersect which is actually the reason why you can destroy worlds and, and, and create worlds and step into and out of worlds. Otherwise, you'd be unable to leave the world of your house in the morning. Worlds aren't actually empirical. They're not yay long and yay wide and so on. They're to do with the stuff that's going on, the stuff that you're into, the stuff that you're about. You don't live in a world. You are into, to use that language, a world or two. So the way people like me talk about ecological issues is very, very disempowering. We're saying literally that it's the end of the world, which is using theological rhetoric to say that you and your stuff and what you do, like go to shops or vote or end racism, doesn't really mean as much as this great big empirical thing. Look, let me slap you upside the head with some numbers, like in the newspaper headlines. Seven, 50%, I already said one. You notice how people like me are always hitting you with these big numbers. 100,000, there's a new set of them every day. Then you turn to the editorial section and read your world is ending and means nothing. We're basically giving ourselves PTSD, then gloating about it. What's wrong with this picture? The dolphins only have flippers. Like I said, they can't turn off the oil for us. But we're so busy making sure that we're in the fetal position, it looks like the dolphins will just have to feel really, really frustrated for now. It doesn't have to be like this. You don't have to use theological language about ends of worlds, the apocalypse, which literally means ripping the veil off. You don't have to do that, mostly because it's not accurate. Something empirically big may not be really actually big, or as we like to say in the philosophy business, ontologically big. For a start, there might only be one of it. There's only one biosphere. There's lots of members of the biosphere, like humans, dolphins, and gut bacteria. The biosphere is ontologically smaller than its members. Actually, that's why it's a fragile. It's a whole, but it's fragile. It's like that line of Shelley that inspired Gandhi and Martin Luther King. We are many, they are few. That isn't just politically accurate and historically correct, it's ontologically true. There really is so much more of us than there is of them. We have the wrong idea about holes. We think they tend towards being omnipotent, omnipresent, and if they're Google omniscient. I wonder where we got this idea from, paging Neoplatonic Christianity. Will Neoplatonic Christian theology please come to this lecture? And talking of theology, we use the language of guilt to talk about this stuff. Now guilt is scaled to individuals. But ecological stuff is about groups of things, populations, ecosystems, flocks, meadows, forests, we're going to see in a moment how the logic that sorts out what's in a group is screwy, but luckily math and logic are different. In fact, it's rather hard to prove even simple mathematical axioms using logic. It takes Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead in their masterwork of the early 20th century, Principia Mathematica, it takes them 400 pages to prove that one plus one equals two. Think about it, first you have to define one, without cheating and using numbers, and therefore being circular and not doing it. Anyway, the math on groups, or to be more technical, heaps, doesn't sound as technical, does it? Is that the group starter solution is four. Two's company, three's a crowd, and four is starter solution for global warming and mass extinction. That means that unless there's four of you, you're not quite yet 
an entity that ecology has anything to say about. You, considered as being on your little ownsome, like me in my living room, writing this, isn't an ecological being. Ecologi e uh, ecology is about relatedness. But there's other ways of thinking about you. You could be yourself, your front garden, and the insects that live on and around it. That's a bit more like it. When you add the corporation you got the weed killer from, you have a nice group that you can talk about in an ecological way. But the, people like, but the way people like me talk about it is almost as if none of those groups of four or, or more mean anything in light of the uber group, the biosphere. Sure, you may not be alive if you didn't have one. That doesn't mean you're not important. In fact, it may mean you're very important because staying alive to protect the biosphere might suddenly become the issue. Oh, look, it did. So, for example, you, you and the food you eat, which is definitely more than four things when you think about the company who made the food and the people who distributed it, is a good place for you as an individual to do ecological action. The most effective thing you can do right now if you're freaking out, which you should be, is eating a bit less meat and voting. Voting. Did I say voting? Who is under 25 here? Ecological beings live at the scale of four beings or more. Logic doesn't like that. Vanilla logic says there aren't really such things as heaps or piles or whatever, because you can chop them down to zero and still get the same answer to the question, is this a heap? So logic concludes that such questions are meaningless or that there are no groups or piles. Great, you made the problem go away. There's no such thing as society, as Mrs. Thatcher used to say. There's no such thing as a biosphere. It's just lots of life forms. Oh, great, I was getting really worried about mass extinction, and you've reassured me that it's not real. Isn't it funny, in a not funny way, how people like me actually copy these sorts of argument when we seem to imply that your little group of things, your little world, isn't really one at all. It's paralyzing, and it gives you a good reason to feel paralyzed. This, as they say, is not working. So the overall effect is your world is meaningless, we're all going to die, an actual little you needs to feel very, very guilty about that. Well, I mean, it's better than feeling no guilt at all. There's a great word for a person who feels no guilt or anxiety, the psychopath. If you think about it collectively, human behavior has been a bit like a psychopath to non-human beings for a while. We just shovel them around without any guilt. Um, you could almost you come up with a word like ecopath to, to describe it. So yeah, guilt is in the right, thank you for laughing nervously. So, so yeah, guilt is in the right direction, but it's not accurate. It's like pointing your plane in the direction of Europe if you want to get to London. <laughs> There's an extra bit of a joke in there somewhere. That's correct, but you're going to have to go to a higher resolution than that if you want to land in some country or other. And then you're going to have to get even more specific and point the plane towards London. So what's the higher resolution way of looking at all of this? Well, to get to higher resolution, you have to refine your way of looking. So you have to say, London is over here, it's not over there. No, left a bit, right a bit, up, down, got it. One word for this, when it comes to refining concepts, is, is the word disambiguate. So we're going to disambiguate two things that seem the same. They look the same because the plane is too far away to distinguish them. We're going to disambiguate guilt and responsibility. We're going to argue that where we want to land the ecoplane is not in guilt. That's like saying you need to land in Britain when you actually want to land in London. You can't actually land in Britain at all. You can't actually base ecological speech on guilt at all. Why? Because ecology at all is about groups of things, populations, systems, habitats, forests, biomes, species. And guilt is, as I say, scaled towards individuals. Individuals confronting another being a being who is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. There's a pretty huge level jump there, an infinite one. How do you get there from here? That's the thing. It's deliberately daunting. God is supposed to be. But if you look at climate change like that, we'll be totally paralyzed. Now, climate change isn't omnipotent. I hope it isn't anyway. It can't be. It mustn't be. And there's a lot of small-seeming things that smaller entities can do, like farmers, for example, that have a huge effect. Letting 10% of your fields go f wild and fallow, for example, in the places in the states where corn is grown, has a massive, massive effect on the Mississippi River, wildlife, carbon emissions, dot, dot, dot. It's like a whole set of problems to do with agriculture go away if you do that, 10%. Actually, I cleave to a philosophical view in which huge things like climate can't be 
omnipotent, because nothing can be omnipotent. Climate isn't infinite. It can't be everywhere, and it can't do everything. Climate is finite. It's very, very big, and we're inside of it, but it's finite. I like to use this phrase, very large finitude, to describe these things, and in particular, I like to call them hyperobjects. They are things, they're just really big, really distributed in time and space. To use theological language, climate isn't a god. Climate is more like what the Greeks called a titan. A colossal being, but one that can be defeated. Remember how in Greek mythology the gods defeated the titans? That's sort of encouraging. Climate is titanic. Global warming is titanic. Mass extinction is titanic, but not infinite. And in the face of them, you shouldn't feel guilty. Like I said, a bit less meat, eating a bit less of that is good for the biosphere. I'm not going to guilt you out and insist you eat none at all because of the scale thing I'm talking about. Eating a bit less has a massive effect when billions of people do it. Really, not guilty. You're not guilty. I'm going to say something now, and some of you are going to go, phew, what a relief. I can carry on just the same as usual, and some of you are going to go, oh my God, he just let the Trump administration off the hook. And believe me, as our president says, neither of those things is something I like, but I sort of have to say something like this thing so we can get to the next bit. How will you react to what I'm about to say is very much a symptom of thinking of holes as godlike and very big holes as infinite or omnipresent or something. You need to be a holist to, do, to be into ecology. But the way we talk about holes is really buggy in a really bad way. And this bugginess comes from the fatalistic kinds of theistic belief where the apocalypse, the fact that the world burns, literally in this case, doesn't matter because heaven, redemption, resurrection, and so on. What I'm going to say is this. When you start your car, you don't do anything to the planet. Compared to how massive the planet is, one engine going vroom is statistically meaningless. But billions of those things, you doing that lots of times along with everyone else, is exactly causing global warming, along, of course, with all the emissions from industrial agriculture and power stations and oil corporations and, and, and so on and so on. I'm going to say that again because it's a very curious paradox, and we need to think about this exact thing right now. Things that you don't actually do yourself in this moment, in this one instance, but then you scale up your view and you find you are part of this huge thing. America, the human species, global, corporate, whatevers, and so on. And this huge thing is doing, is doing something, something you don't like at all. And furthermore, and here's the really weird bit, you will never be able to figure out exactly when, where the level jump happens. Do we affect the biosphere as a whole on a scale of tens of humans, hundreds, thousands, millions? Exactly how many millions? 3.5, 3.56? It's a, it's a logical paradox. You can say that a pile of sugar is a pile no matter how many grains you take away. So you can end up with just one or two grains and it's still a pile. This means there must be something screwy with ordinary vanilla logic, and there is. It can't cope very well with ambiguous and contradictory things. And environments and life forms are highly ambiguous and, and, and contradictory. Let's put it another way. Um, go, go, go back to this phrase, we are the asteroid. I've actually got this art piece going on with uh, Justin Gariglia of New York City, and it's called We Are the Asteroid. I've got pins on me. What does it mean? Well, well, here you are sitting in a chair listening to this, and here we are in this big theater, and at the same time we're hurtling towards Earth, just like the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. It's a way of putting it that makes you think of this weird-seeming level jump between what you're doing at one scale and what you're doing at another scale. Global warming solutions are at a 7.5 billion people scale. Guilt implies good versus evil. Good versus evil implies less than 7.5 billion people because there have to be some bad ones to distinguish the good ones. You're in a hole and the hole is doing something bad, but you are not something bad. Not all the way through, you aren't causing global warming. If you think about it, that means that being in a hole doesn't mean dissolving into it completely. This complete dissolving idea, like, like sugar in tea, is why the extreme right is able to say anti-Semitic things about globalism versus nationalism. If you support globalism, so they say, it means you hate nationalism. Let's just use the most stupid, childish way of talking about it, like how someone high up just said it at a rally. It's a zero-sum game. Globalism wins, means nationalism loses. But holes can't be like that. Nations can't be crystals of sugar that totally dissolve in the tea of the globe. 
If you have five more hours, I can prove it to you logically. Shoot, we don't have that. But the vague idea is if things exist, if things exist in the same way as other things, um, so if there's a football team, it exists in the same way as the football players. So the team is one, there's, there's one of it, and the players are 11. So there are more parts than whole. This, is th this thing we love to say, that the whole is always greater than the sum of its parts, is really just this buggy meme that we like to retweet because it makes us feel clever. But it's time to let it go, seriously. Something you do 30 years from now doesn't seem very relevant to what you're doing now, and vice versa. As we all know from social media, humans have trouble thinking of big amounts of things, like time or space, beyond a certain number. Primary school kids and teachers can tell you the story of the universe and evolution, the order of the events, yes, yeah? stars, dust, cooling planets, water, bacteria, dot, 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 mammals, humans. But the feel of how long each part took, that's really hard to be intuitive about. So that's part of it, but also this logical flaw in theological ways of understanding wholes and parts. We need to talk about all this and fix it because right now we do desperately actually need to imagine millions and billions of people doing things over 100-year timescales. And one thing that gets in the way is the idea that at those scales, you and me and the worlds we live in mean nothing at all. The trouble is, actual specific Tim Morton won't mean very much at all. It's true, amazingly, in 2250. But everything Tim Morton did will take on a huge significance. So actual Tim Morton feeling guilty sounds about right, but as we've seen, it's really vague. It feels like a needle stabbing you when you feel guilt, but at this scale, it's not a needle. It is, as the Brits like to say, about as useful as a chocolate teapot. So what's the concept we need to use instead? Responsibility. We need to disambiguate guilty and responsible. You can be responsible for something without being guilty for it. You didn't let that cat out, but you are responsible for not hitting it with your car as you drive down the street and it runs across your path. Responsibility requires really simple checks without any theological subtleties at all. So you can check if you're responsible for something by checking to see whether you understand it. Do you see the cat? Do you understand about what happens when the car hits cats? You are responsible for the cat. Do you see that boy running after the cat and about to get hit by that truck? You don't have to prove that you pushed the boy out of the door. In fact, if you try, you'll waste a lot of time and the boy will get hit anyway. The president just admitted global warming is real. That's enough. He's responsible. You can hold him responsible. Him then saying he doesn't know whether humans caused it or not is in the language of guilt. You don't need it. You can use something much more simple. The president understands global warming, great. He's admitted he's responsible for it. I think a lot of the time maybe we should talk about things like what does responsible mean to you or what does believe mean to you rather than going on about penguins and stuff. That and fighting racism and misogyny, homophobia, transphobia and so on with all of our heart because that will get us to connect to the penguins so much faster. Again, if you have five hours, I can prove it. This means you can totally relax about establishing guilt about global warming, doesn't it? And the fact that you're now thinking, wow, Professor Morton just let the right and big oil and the first world totally off the hook is a symptom of how totally addicted we are to thinking the holes as huge cups of tea that dissolve everything into them like they were little sugar crystals. This doesn't just apply to global warming, does it? Said the quite left-wing scholar, nervously treading on dangerous ground, yet again in what seemed like an endless loop of that bit in Shrek, where Donkey jumps up and down going, pick me, pick me. Only what I want to be picked for is scapegoating by groups. Pick me, pick me, I'll say the evil thing so you don't have to. So here I go saying it. That's why they pay me the medium-sized bucks. And I'm gonna tell you again the big reason why I say this evil stuff. It's because it's true. We talk about big scale things in terms established to keep individuals under control in the Middle Ages. This isn't working, folks. So I'm gonna say it again. You can relax about feeling guilty, but you're not off the hook and neither is big oil and all that. You're responsible. You can understand it. This is great in another way because guilt is pointing at the past while responsibility is pointing at the future. And we're so running out of time here. In a way, fussing about who did it, exactly who, is part of the problem. Maybe jellyfish caused it. It doesn't sort of matter. You understand it, you're responsible for it. 
I think people like me shouldn't spend one more second going on about who did it and how bad we should feel for not attacking those who did it or attacking yourself if you did it. We should spend all those seconds inspiring people to feel as responsible for global warming as we feel when we see a child running into traffic. Climate is huge. You don't have to worry about whether you made it wrong or not. You can peel yourself off the floor. You can do all kinds of things that have an effect built up over time in groups of actions and collectively in larger groups. You're totally responsible. You're not guilty. Thank you. <laughs>